historic structures and um, primarily concrete structures, which is definitely my favorite. Um, so today we're going to talk about modernist concrete and the challenges specifically associated with preserving concrete um, structures of that era. And I really appreciate this opportunity um, by CPF to be part of this grouping of webinars and events this summer, um, albeit all of it's virtually now given our current situation, but I do appreciate the opportunity um, to speak with everybody today. Um, uh, we will, moving on to the AIA slides. Um, this is an AIA um, program, copyright, the, the one everybody wants to see, the learning objectives for today. We're going to talk about characteristics of modernist concrete structures, to also talk about deterioration mechanisms, really the most common um, with concrete structures, talk about assessment and evaluation, and also go through repair options for conservation of modernist structures. And we will have, a, I will have a case study at the end that highlights that um, for a successful repair program and conservation. And if you didn't see Alan Hess's discussion and presentation last week, I recommend it. And one of the biggest takeaways um, that I took from it, you know, and, and I think it's really important is, you know, the modernist structures, they're not just the, the ones that define our skylines or the iconic ones or the landmarked ones. They really are every day. Um, structures that you know we come across so so often um, and so you know I also want to highlight that with concrete you know these concrete structures really are everywhere they do define our skylines but they are also our infrastructure there are ballparks there are recreation facilities there are buildings our offices they're everywhere and so really understanding what makes these unique what sets them apart and then developing um, strategies to repair and conservation approaches for these buildings because they do have different needs than other materials. Um, and so really focusing on that is kind of the point of the presentation today. Really quickly, um, you know, concrete is a material, it's a non-homogeneous material, it's water, it's aggregate, and it's cement. Concrete's different from mortar in that it has coarse aggregate or pea gravel, you know, it can range from three eighths of an inch upwards to an inch or more depending on the material and as well as the date of construction. Um, and the water component is really important. The amount of water will change the characteristics of the concrete, not only the workability or the flowability of the material, but also the strength of the concrete and other characteristics. How porous is it? So you may hear people refer to the water to cement cementitious ratio um, or W over C. Um, and you know, that's where you can really understand or, or can kind of gauge the characteristics of the concrete a little bit. Concrete also will have chemical um, or material admixtures added to it. These could be air entrainment for durability. They could be workability agents. Um, and so, but these have changed. These definitely have changed and really been part of technology. I think we're all pretty familiar with seeing ready mix trucks on the road and that, you know, ready mix material has been around for over, you know, 100 years or so. Um, but I also just want to highlight that concrete can also be site batched and it can also come in as a pre bagged proprietary material. So concrete, it's a modern construction material, you know, it's been used really in the modern era, um, but it technology has changed and with that characteristics have changed. So not only the material and the technology of the material has changed in our understanding of that material, but reinforcement, placement, technolo placement technologies um, and abilities, as well as formwork. Um, all of these has changed, have really changed over time. And we saw really kind of large advancements and changes during World War II. Um, then that was really applied. And so we saw a big change after World War II and really in that modernist era. So not only were the design aesthetics changing, but the technology was finally there for architects to realize kind of, you know, the creativity designs and understand concrete as a material. And so that's, we're really gonna focus on that one era um, there. So what does that mean when we start talking about the modernist era and what was that? Well, concrete started being utilized, um, 
you know, really kind of not just for the structural or the infrastructure, you know, and kind of hidden away, um, covered with plaster or other ornament, but it kind of came to the forefront. So the structural elements that were made of concrete, the columns, the beams, they were left unadorned, they were left visible. And you can see the staircase, the, um, you know, the structure to support the sweeping staircase is all concrete and it's left exposed and unadorned. And so now the technology, you know, the structural understanding was there and the design aesthetic was coming into play to leave these elements, you know, kind of open and unadorned. And so the concrete really became this ultimate material for modernist architects, both in the, within the states and internationally. And so they started to play with the kind of the designs that they could get and concrete becoming kind of its own ornament. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But here we have three buildings. We have one um, Shark Tower or Shark Valley Observation Tower in the Everglades. In the middle, we have Mies van der Rohe's Promontory Apartments in Chicago um, in that state in 1949. And then of course we have Marina City by Bertrand Goldberg also in Chicago. Um, from 1964. So these are three structures where concrete, you know, was utilized by the designers kind of left to show, you know, its support, but also it was its own decoration. Um, and so it really wasn't just leaving it exposed for concrete for what it was, but the concrete itself became the aesthetic. Um, and especially during the modernist era, architects really started playing with the con playing with concrete as a material, playing with the formwork and understanding that the way the concrete was placed and the material itself was the aesthetic or that was the decor that they were going for. So the material constituents, you know, they started experimenting with that, the aggregates um, and different materials to be able to achieve different finishes, the formwork technology, the use of plywood to get kind of more sweeping um, surfaces as opposed to the board form, um, but also the form tie holes that became an aesthetic choice, the placement of those. So it wasn't just for how the concrete was placed and able to, you know, for these forms to be able to hold the concrete in place without moving, but the formwork themselves became part of the, the um, aesthetic. So here um, on the left, you can see Louis Kahn's Salk Institute, and we'll talk about that a little later. And then on the right, this is a Bobardi design in Sao Paulo. And you can see the concrete is left exposed, it's unadorned, but you can also see kind of the details that come into play with just how, how it was placed um, and the formwork themselves. So, you know, as I mentioned before, concrete was in all types of structures, you know, not just our, our office buildings, and residential, but also recreational. And so how these buildings were used kind of came into play with their design or how the concrete was being utilized, but also how it was maintained and cared for. Um, here we actually have two recreational facilities. On the left is Miami Marine Stadium by Candela. And then on the right, which was actually an inspiration for Candela, um, is Eduardo Trejo's racetrack. And that is in Miami. And so you can see with the technology and the structural understanding, we were able to get kind of these, you know, cantilevered structures, these sweeping shapes. And so those, that geometry itself um, became the aesthetic and they were left unadorned. Um, and one thing I really want to point out is, you know, both of these are in relatively mild climates. And so a lot of, especially in California as well, a lot of these modernist structures are just now kind of reaching, becoming of age or of prominence. And at the same time, they're also really just needing their first round of repairs. And so now really is the time to understand these challenges um, that comes with preserving these structures. And one of those is really understanding the characteristics that make all of these structures unique. If the concrete is exposed and, it, and the concrete itself is the aesthetic, we need to understand these characteristics and what makes these structures unique or what makes them special. Um, so it's not just, you know, the detail and the finish and the aggregate, um, but understanding the concrete material itself, um, the constituents and how it was used, how the placement techniques, but something I also really want to highlight, and this will be kind of a running theme, is that variable appearance. Concrete is a non-homogeneous material, and so, you, you know, even if the same material was placed throughout a structure using the same techniques and the same Formwork, there will be changes in that appearance. And so understanding those variations, how those came into play and how those impact the aesthetic of the structure are also really important. Um, so when you're looking at a structure, um, you know, 
it's important to understand not only the large, the massing and the structure as a whole, um, you know, looking at the sculpture, uh, the Chilato's eulogy to the horizon, but understanding, you know, when you get up close to that, to that sculpture and start looking at it, you can see the form board. The form board and the placement of the material itself became part of the aesthetic. And on the left, you can see that as well, where, you know, the formwork was installed to give an aspect of the design but not only just kind of those larger massings and some of those details with the formwork, but the details. And that's what's really important. And here again, I'm really going to focus on the variation of the appearance. You know, here we have three types of finishes. On the left, you have a board form finish, and you can really see actually the detail from the wood itself. And that, you know, has remained. And that is a prominent detail of this building and of this structure. So to lose that, you know, would be detrimental to the overall appearance. On the far right, we have an exposed aggregate material. Um, and you can see, even though it's the same mix and the same procedure to place and expose the aggregate, the variation, not only in which aggregates are exposed, the colors of the aggregate, but kind of the, the grouping and the clusters of the aggregate. So when you stand back and look at it, it kind of, you know, gives an, an overall seamless appearance, kind of looks like one, but when you get up close, you really have to understand these details. Another thing that we get with concrete is bug holes. And you can see that in the center picture here. And bug holes, you know, are when water or air gets entrapped on the surface, with the formwork and the formwork comes off and you're left with a little void there on the surface. And these, you know, they have no rhyme or reason. Um, you can't control where they show up, but again, it's, a, it's an important detail and something to understand with the appearance. So here we have three types of concrete, three different placement methods, three types of formwork, um, and all have these really unique details um, with, within their variable appearance. That's really important to understand and be able to understand to characterize um, with any of these types of these modernist structures. So modernist structures really is with kind of any concrete project goal, you know, there are certain goals that have to be achieved, you know, understanding the original construction and identifying the significant characteristics. Um, and these two can be really different with modernist structures, again, because the way the concrete materials were placed and the concrete materials themselves really come into play with the overall aesthetic. So really honing in on that and understanding that is critical. Um, causes of distress and deterioration, um, obviously, right, that's, that's why we're looking at these buildings trying to extend their service life and repair them. So we need to understand, you know, why we're seeing the distress that we're seeing. Any previous repair work um, that was completed obviously working in accordance with governing entities, Secretary of the Interior Standards, um, you know, is important. And again, the ultimate goal, right, is durable repairs, you know, so repairs that are not going to be detrimental to the structure themselves that match the existing. And so they do not detract from the structure itself, from the aesthetic of the structure itself. And so to do that really is a multi-phased approach um, and that always starts, you know, with the assessment um, and looking at the existing documents, the field investigation, and then also having laboratory studies completed. And, and depending on what you're trying to achieve um, with any project will kind of dictate what all that is completed as part of the assessment, as well as what's also available um, to be done. So, you know, existing documents, we all know how hard sometimes these are to get for historic structures, sometimes even prominent and iconic structures. It can be difficult to get your hands on documents, but these really are important and critical to understand not only the material, the intent of the material, um, the layout of the reinforcing, you know, these are, these are important. And oftentimes with these documents, you can get a mixed design with them, but oftentimes you don't. Um, Photographs are also really important, especially with modern structures in understanding how the concrete was placed, um, what the formwork looked like. Oftentimes formwork and placement techniques are not outlined in project documents. They're not on the design documents. It's worked out in the field um, or the, you know, the contractor says, this is how I'm going to do it. And they, you know, works with the architect to get that figured out. So, you know, having those photographs can be really important. Again, sometimes these are hard to get a hold of. 
but also, you know, don't forget about newspaper articles. Um, sometimes these can be really interesting because they really hone in on what was deemed to be unique or new technology or what was going to be an interesting characteristic of the building. Um, so here the quote taken from this 1932 Los Angeles Times article where talking about the modern trend of a monolithic structure um, being cast in concrete, you know, and just kind of saying, hey, this, this is new. We're just going to use this, this new technology, this concrete, it's this trend, and we're going to leave it unadorned in this monolithic structure. So finding those kind of quotes are, are important to understand at the time, maybe what was considered important or prominent or unique. Um, there as you know, then as you move into the field, as part of the assessment, you're going to be looking for documenting any of the visual distress. So looking at cracks and spalls and anything else that may out, be out there, documenting all of that to get an understanding of potential deterioration mechanisms or distress mechanisms. Um, and I, I want to briefly talk about mechanisms of deterioration. I don't have a lot of time here and this this is a whole nother talk in and of itself but there are various ways of deterioration for concrete structures probably the most common is going to be corrosion related deterioration um, and that is where you get corrosion of your reinforcement and, or any kind of embedded metal um, and that induces stress on the concrete resulting in cracking and ultimately spalling um, and there are you know corrosion is a chemical reaction it's a chemical process so you need certain things to to achieve that and so understanding if you do have corrosion what is impacting that corrosion and, and how can you mediate it or stop it um, you can also have material related deterioration so that could be freeze thaw distress a sulfate attack deleterious aggregates um, again this is kind of the concrete in an exposure kind of breaking itself apart. So not related to the reinforcement, which would be corrosion, but the material of concrete itself. Original design and construction defects, sometimes repairs started before the you know, construction was even over, but this could also be poor placement practices where you are left with honeycombing or voids, um, failure of previous repair attempts or protection systems. So these would be things that were installed to either extend the service life or as part of original construction. And then there could, these could have failed, um, resulting in an issue. And then of course there's structural distress. Um, you know, a change in loading, the, or the structure itself, you know, is failing, but of course you also have impact earthquakes, hurricanes, um, outside sources. So I want to focus on previous repairs and understanding if there have been previous repair campaigns at the building. Um, and some of these, you know, it's likely that there have been. The extent usually is unknown. Um, but even in a mild climate, there probably have been repairs done at some point. Maybe it was just installation of another paint coating where it could be reached um, or something, you know, albeit small, but just understanding what these repair campaigns are, you know, what was the intent of the repair, um, you know, what was the full scope of the repair, did they go behind the reinforcement, did they do it to address corrosion, um, what was the intended service life, what's the projected service life of the repairs, um, but especially with, you know, historic concrete and modernist concrete and looking at these structures, is the repair reversible? Um, that's really important to understand that, you know, any repair that was done could be reversed, as well as is, is it a successful match to the original concrete. Obviously, the picture here is of a repair that is not an aesthetic um, success story by any stretch of the imagination, but it's also, you know, there may be potential issues there with the fact that it may not have the service life intended. Um, besides visual observations and looking at understanding both the asphalt construction of a building and the um, potential distress or deterioration mechanisms, we have several tools um, within the non-destructive evaluation toolbox. Some of these are, are relatively simple, you know, sound testing, hitting the concrete with a hammer to find unsound areas um, or debonded areas of concrete but also some of them can get more complicated. Um, you know, use of a cover meter, 
or a packometer to look for reinforcement can give you an idea of the layout of the reinforcement, but there are also various technologies. And again, they can get very complicated and very high tech. Um, but with any of these technologies, it's really important that the person utilizing them both you know, in the field as well as interpreting the results is experienced with the use of non-destructive technologies and any non-destructive evaluation should be confirmed and verified with exploratory openings. Um, that's really important to calibrate and correlate your non-destructive results. So exploratory openings, yes, it's destructive, but you can get so much information um, from an exploratory opening, the as-built conditions, the types of deterioration, maybe a hidden condition, um, or even demonstrate a potential for a removal technique. Um, these really are important, obviously, with a you know, modern structure where everything is kind of exposed. It should be in kind of a less visible location, if possible, but these should not be ruled out um, just because they're destructive. They are really important um, as part of an overall assessment strategy. But sometimes these exploratory openings can be an area where there is a spall or debonded concrete. So you can kind of remove loose concrete while you're out there and have a little bit of your own exploratory opening. Um, and really what you find is kind of why did I have this fall or what was the deterioration mechanism you can get, you know, you can find that just with the removal of some loose concrete. So here, obviously we have a spall, you can see the corroded reinforcement there. But another thing that's really important to gather is how much concrete is between that reinforcement and the exterior. So that concrete there, again, from the surface of the building to the front of the reinforcement, that's what we call concrete cover. Um, and that's protection around the reinforcement. And I'll talk about that a little later, um, but that's an important as-built condition to document within a concrete structure. Um, so depending on the, you know, ability to sample or what you're thinking in terms of laboratory studies or what you need, you know, there are various techniques for sampling. The, what is being asked of the laboratory may dictate your sampling. Um, sometimes petrographic studies, and I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit, can be done with fragments or loose pieces that you pull off of the building. But if you're really trying to understand the compressive strength of the concrete, you know, you need intact cores that can't be done with, with rubble or fragments. And so understanding what, what the questions are and what the samples are needed to answer those questions is important as part of the sampling process. So laboratory studies, you know, there's lots of things that can be determined in the laboratory and petrography, Petrography is the study of concrete to understand the characteristics within the laboratory with microscopic observations as well as chemical studies. And so these characteristics that can be understood is what are the types of aggregate, how much aggregate is in there, um, potentially are there admixtures, getting an understanding of what the air entrainment looks like, um, estimation of the water to cementitious ratio. Again, it's an important number to understand. Um, are there chlorides in the concrete? You know, has the concrete been exposed to chlorides, which can um, accelerate corrosion, the corrosion there. But also, you know, laboratory studies could include compressive strength. If, you're, if you have to understand that as part of a conservation approach or a change of use, um, understanding the compressive strength of concrete from a structural standpoint is really important. Plus there are other physical tests that can also be done that may answer questions for, you know, the ultimate goals of the project. Um, so carbonation, again, there's a couple things I want to highlight um, and talk about. So carbonation is when carbon dioxide enters the concrete, it reacts chemically with the constituents, and it results in a reduction of the alkalinity of concrete. So concrete, when it's initially placed, is very alkaline. We're talking pH usually above 12, um, which while it's not very good for getting on your skin, it's really great for the reinforcement. Um, a highly alkaline environment actually passivates the corrosion process of reinforcement. 
So again, you know, corrosion being one of the most common reasons we have distress and deterioration on concrete structures, it's really important to understand, do we have reinforcement within a highly alkaline environment or has that alkalinity been reduced? And so we have lost that passiv passivation on the reinforcement. And a test that can be used to determine that is carbonation testing. And it's the application of a chemical, phenolphthalein, onto a freshly fractured surface. And, you, and it changes color depending on the alkalinity. And so that's what you see here is a photo of a carbonation study that has been completed. But then that data also needs to be compared with what is your cover. So again, understanding how deep your reinforcement is from the surface of the wall or the surface of the structure is important because that comes into play with our carbonation studies. So these are all things that tie into laboratory studies, field assessment, document, documentation, um, you know, really kind of developing an understanding of why we have distress and deterioration on the structure. Once you've completed the assessment, again, the findings of the assessment are going to dictate kind of that repair approach. So you're going to want to address any distress or deterioration, again, with durable repairs that are going to match. Um, and to do that, you're going to have to establish a procedure and a standard of care for both the technical qualities, again, compressive strength, workability, all sorts of things with the concrete, as well as um, the aesthetic qualities of repair. So that's going to need development of mixed design, looking at placement procedures, as well as finishing. And just as it, it was important during the original construction of modernist structures, you know, all of these things are going to come into play and able to achieve a aesthetic match to the structure that you have there. And so mock-ups and trials kind of become the primary vehicle to work alongside the contractor to be able to achieve these um, qualities and characteristics of the concrete repair to match the existing structure. Um, if you aren't familiar with it, I recommend Preservation Brief 15. Um, you know, to download it has a lot of information regarding concrete um, of all vintages, not just modern, but all vintages. But it also has some good resources and points people in different directions depending on um, what you may be looking for, you know, more information on deteriorating mechanisms or something like that. Preservation Brief 15 is a good place to start. So the repair mix design. So yes, we need something that aesthetically matches our substrate, but we also need something that is technically compatible. Um, so both our compressive strength, our modulus of elasticity, these characteristics need to match with the existing substrate. Is our repair material going to be able to bond with our substrate material? Um, all of these things, again, these technical questions need to be answered and addressed as part of the repair mix design, as well as the aesthetic component. And again, with a modernist structure, there's really nowhere to hide. Um, so, you know, the color and the finish and the aggregates and all these things need to kind of come together to be able to match. And so, you know, your existing substrate, so trials are going to be really important, um, as well as quality control, making sure that any mix design is repeatable and is achieving the technical requirements that are needed. And one thing that I wanna point out is concrete, um, you know, takes a while to fully cure out. It takes a while to reach its ultimate strength. And so it's not a material where you can place it or cast a sample one day and the very next day have an understanding of what the ultimate color is going to look like. It will, as the concrete cures, um, the color will change and some of the other characteristics may change as well as it cures out. So, you know, it may take a month or two months to really understand what that sample is going to look like ultimately um, in trying to replicate that. So again, it's not a quick process, so make sure that that is built into any, any schedule. Um, but, you know, it's not just the material itself and the aesthetics, but again, also that placement technique, the finishing technique, um, and also developing the formwork. And so that comes into play with with the mock-ups. And again, you know, I recommend doing all of these off of a building. Um, you know, you don't really want to experiment on the structure, especially if it's prominent or significant. Um, and so these can be, you know, all these challenges can be worked out off-site. But again, just as, you know, the material and the placement technology and the formwork and all of those were critical to the ultimate appearance 
of a modern concrete structure, um, the same is going to be for, for the repairs. And so, yes, we have newer technologies, newer materials. We have, you know, different standards or, you know, different type levels of craftsmanship um, than were when these buildings were originally constructed. But we have to still utilize kind of the same process um, in developing them. And, and so the craftsmanship also for any contractor is going to be really important um, in making sure that it a high level of finish and appearance matching can be achieved. So craftsmanship definitely goes up, especially with a modern structure where, you know, again, all these variable characteristics come into play um, with the final aesthetic. And so a you know, high level of craftsmanship really is needed to match um, the existing structure. So repair implementation, again, repairs for a sound and durable repair are going to be very similar to any concrete repair, you know, whether it be a parking garage with little to no aesthetic implications or, you know, a warehouse, but ultimately, you know, enough material has to be removed to get, you know, to remove any unsound material to address at the deterioration mechanism, the distress mechanism. Um, and again, if that's corrosion, you need to go behind the bar. So you may be taking out some sound concrete there to get behind the bar because you don't want to leave corroding bar in place or a corrosion product in place. You need to be able to access it to clean the bar, potentially install a corrosion inhibiting coating. Um, you know, but these really need to address why the deterioration is there. Um, so yes, you may be removing sound material, install your formwork, um, just as done in the mock-ups to match and place the material just as was done in the mock-ups to and finish it to achieve um, the, the desired appearance and finish to match the adjacent concrete. Um, here you see a couple images of surface preparation and ongoing. Again, surface preparation is critical to the success of any concrete repair not just in a historic store, but any concrete repair, surface prep is really critical. You may be limited on a modernist structure or a historic concrete structure to surface preparation methods available. Um, here you see a needle scaler being used on a, on a structure, but that doesn't mean that surface prep could be less. A, a reduction in surface prep could lead to a reduction in surface life of any repair. Um, the photograph on the right, what you see is the application of corrosion inhibiting coating. Um, and that was really to mitigate corrosion, which was the primary deterioration mechanism as part of this project. And so that's, a, that's an option, but there are other options as well um, for mitigating corrosion, but you have to understand the structure um, as well as the, um, the structure, how it was built, you know, and, and the material characteristics as well to understand what is the best process to remediate any kind of distress or deterioration that is ongoing. And installation of formwork to match existing and placement of the concrete. And so, you know, this is going to be similar to other concrete processes, but the formwork was probably going to be a bit, you know, higher craftsmanship. Um, but also, again, all of this would be worked out as part of the mock-ups because once you get on the building things things um, are challenging anyways so working out kind of all those difficult aspects of it off building are really important and so that's why you know so that what's done on the building is similar to the mock-ups and trials right practice makes perfect and that's really important especially with these types of structures Quality control with any concrete repair project is really important, making sure the material is as expected, that the material is consistent, that there aren't changes in constituents. Um, and so that includes both plastic testing, um, the left you can see a slump test being done. Um, so both you know, fresh concrete testing during placement um, and during construction, as well as looking at hardened concrete properties, including compressive strength. And so that's where you see on the right hand side, um, cylinders that were cast with concrete that will later be tested in a laboratory to monitor compressive strength and make sure that there aren't changes in constituents that are having, you know, fl causing fluctuations in the compressive strength, either high or low. Both could be 
potentially problematic, but it's, you know, maintaining consistency and that the concrete is as it's expected and as was developed during the trials and the mock-ups. So now I'm going to jump into a case study to talk about, um, you know, kind of everything that I just kind of introduced, how it came into play on one structure, and that's the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. If you're not familiar with it, the Salk Institute located in La Jolla, California, it's um, situated on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it was established by Jonas Salk, who um, came up with the polio vaccine. Um, and he hired Louis Kahn, and the intent was they wanted a modern building that was going to inspire science. And so that was kind of always always important. Um, and this was actually Kahn's first con primarily concrete massing um, building. And so he knew up front that the concrete was going to be important. And that came into play during the design and construction processes um, with that. Um, so this project, just a quick introduction on the project. Um, in the Salk Institute understood that they had a very important structure, not just for the science that was being done within the building, but the building itself and what it meant to both the scientific and the architecture communities. Um, and so the Salk Institute partnered with the Getty Conservation Institute to develop a conservation management plan. Um, as part of that plan, you know, priorities were laid out and different characteristics and materials were highlighted within that plan, and then the Salk Institute partnered with, or um, with Wiss Jenny Elsner to work on the teak window walls. That was considered priority. Um, that project was completed in 2017. Um, and that was a, an interesting project in that over two thirds of the original teak was able to be saved, as well as the functionality of the window walls, including reduction in water intrusion was able to be achieved. As part of that project, um, and, and looking at the CMP, the Salk Institute also kind of built on that into the concrete, looking at doing some, some repair work with their concrete, because they knew that was going to be the next project they need to undertake following the, the teak window walls. Um, so again, this was a collaboration between Salk and Khan, um, you know, but also, you know, Khan had this vision and he was able to implement it in concrete. And the, during the design iterations, they knew they always wanted it to be concrete and that it was going to be left exposed. And you know, so therefore it was really important during the process to look at the mixed designs and the samples, again, for technical considerations, the compressive strength, the workability, how is it going to be placed, as well as the final aesthetics, um, color and finish. Um, where are the form tie holes going to be, the fins, the joints, all these characteristics, you know, Khan had a hand in and really looked at that. Um, the buildings themselves are constructed of reinforced concrete structural components um, with, you know, teak window walls. And I could, you know, go on and on and on about how this building was actually constructed, especially the structural aspect of it. The structural design was by August Commandant. Um, and really a key component to it is he used Verendale trusses, which are a type of truss typically used on bridges, but it was utilized, that design was utilized within this building to give kind of these wide open spaces unencumbered with columns that was really important for the, you know, for the science and having these open labs and these wide open laboratory spaces. Um, again, I could go on and on, but we're not, we're moving on. So um, understanding, you know, the importance of really looking at these structures, you know, Khan understood, you know, kind of the importance that the concrete itself was going to have, but also the, um, you know, the Salk, Salk Institute understood the importance of the concrete on the overall aesthetic and longevity of the building. So as I mentioned, as part of the Teak Window Wall project, they saw the opportunity to also start the concrete conservation project knowing it was going to take a while, it would be a multi-phased approach, and it's not something that could be completed very quickly. Um, so we started with our assessment. We started looking at original construction documents, um, and amazingly, the Salk Institute saved pretty much everything from original construction. Um, we had photographs, um, almost daily photographs, definitely weekly photographs of the site. Um, so we got an understanding of, you know, the formwork 
um, but also we had mixed design information. We had the original structural calcs. We had meeting minutes with notes in the margins, handwritten notes in the margins. Um, and these documents told a story of a really detailed development of the mixed design as well as the placement um, of the concrete, looking at how constructible it was going to be, the color, and that final aesthetic um, that was needed or, or wanted. And ultimately, you know, they ended up with, you know, a beautiful structure, of course, I think we would all agree with, to, with that. Um, but the other, you know, third part of the triangle, you know, we have our owner, we have our designer is the contractor. Um, and the superintendent for this structure was Paul Matt, um, who I think a lot, especially in Southern California, are familiar with his his work um, both in original construction of modern structures, but also the preservation of them. Um, and this was his first you know, project in Southern California was the Salk Institute, being the superintendent for the Salk Institute. And before he passed, you know, I had a really great conversation with him where he really highlighted you know, how critical the formwork was and how important it was to have the formwork just right. And they ended up actually using finished carpenters, so cabinet makers, to get the formwork on this building to achieve what they were able to achieve. And, you know, again, a really high level of craftsmanship and understanding of how this concrete was going to be placed and formed and to achieve ultimately, you know, the ultimate aesthetic, right, of this iconic structure. So the original mixed design, again, really, you know, Louis Kahn paid a lot of close attention and, and Dr. Salk was actually involved as well. It was all local materials. Um, unfortunately, some of the quarries are now strip malls, so they're not accessible anymore, but um, they were all local materials. It is a lightweight aggregate structure. They also use pozzolanic materials um, to achieve the color and the technical um, considerations that they wanted. But something that also came up as part of the document review was the amount of mock-ups that were done, the trials and mock-ups and the testing that was completed with the concrete um, you know, during, during this design process and really looking at it. Um, then we started our visual observations out there, again, looking at, you know, where we had distress, the types of distress, documenting the spalls, and primarily what we saw was that it was corrosion-related distress. Again, we are, this is a structure on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean in Southern California, um, and so we were also looking at is the distress consistent on all buildings? You know, elevations that are exposed to the ocean, are they similar to, you know, the east elevations away from the ocean? And, you know, what are those differences? Also, what are the characteristic differences um, between them? And, you know, understanding what potential mechanism for corrosion ongoing. Do we have chlorides in this concrete? Do we have higher rates of chlorides depending on the elevation exposure? These are all questions that we had to ask um, and look into. We also wanted to look at any potential previous repair campaigns that had been done. What made them successful, um, you know, as well as were they still performing? But then also really just as importantly as understanding, you know, documenting all those cracks, all those spalls, everything like that was really understanding the details and the characteristics and the variation between those details. Um, again, the amount of bug holes, you know, differed and, and varied between you know, placement of concrete or elevation or areas, and you can see that in these photos, but also looking at the form tie holes, which are filled with lead plugs, the fins, the reveals, understanding, you know, how some of these varied, um, and just all those little details of what makes this structure as unique and special as it is. We had to document all of these and understand um, what they were, and so looking at them up close. We did do laboratory studies. Um, we did both petrographic studies as well as physical. We had some cores had been taken out for some mechanical work. So we had some good cores that we could um, test and get compressive strength values on. And both the physical testing and the petrographic testing basically aligned with what we expected based on the mix design. Um, the compressive strength is as was had been specified. We had the same materials, we had the lightweight aggregate and, and really the same characteristics that we saw within the mix design. Again, we also did some carbonation testing, looking at that and how that would, might be influencing the rate of corrosion, as well as looking at um, chlorides and 
the amount of chlorides that we had. And we did find chlorides, especially on the west facing elevations. Um, the air carried chlorides off of the ocean were within the concrete. And then we moved into the development of a repair mix design. Um, again, this was done off site or off building. Um, and it was a long process. It, it definitely took a while for it to be completed. Um, I think ultimately there were, you know, 45 to 50 mixed design, trial mixed designs developed that the contractor ended up, um, you know, building a shelf within their field office for all of these. But again, within these mixed designs, we're looking not only at color, but is this concrete, you know, can the, can the con contractor work with it? Is it constructible? And can we achieve the finish that we need, you know, essentially getting those bug holes? I have to say, um, using current materials with a current contractor where bug holes are essentially deemed a surface defect in current construction, um, telling them, hey, I want bug holes. And oh, by the way, can you make them perfectly imperfect and varied? Um, it, it's a tall order and it's very challenging. And so it did take that many opportunities to make sure that we had a material and a placement technique to achieve that. Ultimately, we ended up with a custom mixed design with a palette of five colors. That was something else we noticed is that both due to exposure and um, you know, UV and ocean exposure, the color varied slightly throughout the Salk Institute. So we needed a palette of five colors. Um, and we compared it to concrete that was lightly cleaned. We did a full cleaning program was not going to be implemented, but we wanted to make sure that we were matching concrete and not necessarily surface dirt. Um, and so, you know, once we had these palette of five colors, we were able to compare them and, and they pretty much matched everywhere um, within the building. And again, formwork, just as the formwork was critical to the success of the original construction, formwork was going to be critical to achieving um, repairs that matched, both in getting those details with the fins and the form tie holes, but also, you know, the surface had to be, um, we had to get the right kind of surface. There's a little sheen on the Salk Institute, so we needed to get that sheen and that smooth fit face, but also we had to have formwork that with the concrete mix, we would be able to achieve bug holes. And again, those bug holes, that was probably one of the most challenging aspects of the development of the repair process on this. Um, but ultimately, you know, we did come up with a procedure, again, tweaking the mix design slightly, the placement techniques, the consolidation techniques, but also, um, you know, the craftsmen who are doing the work came up with a very technical solution of once they remove the formwork, expose, you know, tapping the surface with a nylon bristle brush. And this broke some of the surface material over near surface voids or bug holes just enough to give us that varied appearance that we were looking for. Um, but again, that high level of craftsmanship and understanding the material and how to construct with it was really important. But you know, everything was coming together to be able, to, again, to achieve these perfectly imperfect bug holes. Um, so then we went through a trial, trial repair phase um, and worked with the contractor to start implementing these repair approaches. And again, we needed to make sure that we had removal techniques and surface prep techniques to be able to achieve um, a well-bonded, durable, sound repair that's going to be bonded to the substrate. So in order to achieve that, we were looking at, you know, use of very, without damaging adjacent material, right? Um, so small chipping hammers, but also, again, utilizing a needle scaler to clean corrosion product off of the bars and get them prepared for, you know, to receive concrete as well as, you know, prepping the, prepping the lightweight aggregate surface to, to receive the repair material to make sure that they were bonded. Once we'd completed the surface prep, a, um, from our palette of five colors, uh, the color and the mix design that most likely resembled the adjacent concrete was selected. Custom formwork for that repair area was built. And again, all the details were taken into account. Are there um, old nail holes from the original formwork, the form tie holes, the fins, the reveals, all of these little details had to be built in and just perfectly. And then the formwork was installed really tight up against um, the substrate itself. And you can see that in the right photo 
the photo on the right of just how tight a fit we were able to achieve around these fins due to the, the high level of craftsmanship of the carpenter. Again, finished carpentry um, was needed here. Uh, so the formwork, you know, you always have to have a way to get the material into the, re the repair area. Um, and so formwork, you know, we call those bird mouths or spouts. And so you can see on the photo on the left, the little, the tiny little openings to get the material in. So understanding the constructability or flowability of the material and how it's going to be used during the mock-ups was really important in the development of that, of our formwork. A spout was installed and you can see that on the right. And then the material was placed into the formwork. Again, all of this had been done in all of the trials and mock-ups. And so the contractor really had a good handle of the material itself, how it, you know, the consistency to expect, how long it would take really to set up to be able to do some of the final finishing at that bird's mouth. And so this area, you know, had to be treated and had to be finished, you know, really to hide it. It's, you, we need to reduce the visibility of how the concrete got in there for the overall approach for the repairs. Um, and then, of course, the formwork would come off and the technical solution of tapping the surface with a nylon bristle brush, brush was completed to achieve our bug holes. And so, you know, as part of that initial phase of work, um, you know, a handful of locations were selected and the repairs were done. And it was really important to continue with this multi-phased approach of doing an initial phase of repair work, getting the repairs done, and making sure that everything that was done in the mock-ups was constructible on the building before going into production mode, but also giving these repairs a chance to um, weather and wear on the building themselves. Um, you know, really watching the color fade or how they were going to age. And so that was really important. And so completing the initial phase of repair work, um, the intent was to leave that up there, make sure all the you know, stakeholders were happy with the results and then proceed with a phased repair approach. And here you can see um, one wall, um, one return wall where there's two different repairs and there's close-ups of the repairs as part of the initial phase um, on the right. And there's, there's two close-ups there. And ultimately, you know, all of the, the stakeholders, the Salk Institute, everybody was happy with the high level of craftsmanship that we were able to achieve with the initial phase of repair work. Um, and so, you know, it was decided, okay, this may be our approach, but let's let everything weather and wear. And so a year later, um, they were reevaluated and determined that they were ultimately, that these repairs were successful in weathering and aging and curing out to really match the concrete itself. And here, actually, you can see there is a repair as part of the initial phase, as well as previous repairs that had been done on the building. Um, and so you really can't see the, the repair that was done as part of the initial phase, phase of work. And so based on what had been achieved with the trials, the mock-ups, the initial phase of work, WJ developed a um, protocol and put that together in drawings and specifications for the Salk Institute and their now, and that was based on you know, the laboratory studies, the condition assessment, all of those trials and mock-ups and everything that was worked out in detail, um, brought all that together. And now the Salk Institute is undergoing a phased repair approach. They understand that they are kind of in it for the long haul. This is not something that is going to be completed right away, but they are proceeding methodically with additional concrete repairs. Um, and one thing that I think is really important that the Salk has done is the craftsmen who are part of the trials, the mock-ups, the initial phase of work, they're still involved with these ongoing repair processes. And so really establishing that standard of care early on and that high level of craftsmanship, it's important to maintain that continuity, especially for a modern structure where, again, there's nowhere to hide. Everything is exposed. And you know, just as with original construction, the high level of craftsmanship was really important. It's really needed with any repair project as well. And so that's, you know, so the SOC understands the importance of that as they proceed with the work. So in conclusion, um, you know, conventional repair is important and to get sound and durable repairs, but it needs to be taken to the next level on modernist concrete structures. And especially, you know, where, again, there's nowhere to hide. The concrete is the aesthetic. The details of the material itself 
and the placement technologies, that's what makes the building unique and understanding those characteristics. But understanding and collaboration of a project team as well as kind of the full approach is really important. Craftsmanship is key, just as with original construction, as I mentioned. Samples and mock-ups, you can't get away from this, especially with a concrete structure. Um, but you know, all expectations have to be defined and the approach has to be tailored for the project. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's time. And John, I guess let's open it up to questions. Thank you, Anne. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm going to uh, stop screen share here and just open it up to everybody. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to be your only moderator today because Chris is unable to join back into the room. Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, I have a lot of questions here and I've been going through them. Um, there were a few questions that I've sort of addressed through my Google sleuthing and maybe Anne can correct me if okay. they're wrong. Yeah, I, I have not seen, I just started looking at the chat, so I, yeah, I don't know. Um, but what I'll do is I'll start with the, the questions that haven't been answered through my chats. Um, there was one um, about um, uh how much material has to be removed diane is asking how much damaged material needs to be re removed for a sound repair is there a rule of thumb for both concrete and rebar so really anything that's unsound would need to come out the question that we always um on kind of is how much sound material has to come out to be able to achieve a repair that sound um and Care, not only are you addressing, but you also want to make sure that your materials can be well bonded um, and that you know ultimately nobody wants any repairs to fall out at a later date. So, you know, being so behind the reinforcement will give you that sort of mechanical product that, um, you know, kind of holding in a material reinforcement as well as the ability to address corrosion. Um, typically, the rule of thumb is um, the, the size of aggregate plus quarter of an inch. Um, generally, that falls within three quarters of an inch to an inch. When I'm in the field, I usually put contractors that I want them to be able to wrap their fingers around the bar um, because then I know they'll be able to get, get it clean. But also, that's really enough to be able to get the hair material in there um, and make sure that's their fingers, not my skin handling fingers. Um, um, my apologies. Yeah. I think there was an issue with your sound for a second there. Maybe you can try. Oh, no. Let's see. Um, yeah, so I, I was checking with the attendees what uh, if it was just me or if it was them as well. There, there, for some reason, your microphone was bugging out and showing up as garbled. Do you have a second microphone attached or can you maybe switch them? Um, Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was confirming with the attendees. Uh, maybe we can do a, did you try switching the microphone? Can you hear me now? I know it sounds like yes. a little bit further away, but much, it's, much better. It's much yeah. clearer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. So uh, short answer, um, you have to remove all the unsound material. You also have to remove sound material to make sure you have a durable repair. Going behind the bar is generally the diameter of the aggregate and the repair material plus a quarter of an inch usually around three quarters of an inch and I make the contractors put their fingers around the bar but it's important to get behind the bar to make sure your you know repair is held in place as well as be able to clean the bar itself oh John you're muted so I couldn't Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, somebody, uh, there was another question about um, what your opinion is on trying to make concrete repairs to a historic building that uh, that look original versus making repairs that are just visually different to distinguish that it is not trying to be original. I think they're referring to the Secretary of Interior standards where right. um, you know ad additions or or changes in material need to be visually differentiated. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So actually, concrete. Um, you can achieve both um, because if you know current technologies and materials your concrete mix is ultimately going to be different than the substrate itself so 
you can have an overall appearance that matches, you know, the color match, um, the finish, the texture could be a complete match, but your aggregates could be different. And you may, if it's not exposed aggregate, you won't see it. So that's a way to differentiate. There will be potentially different admixtures in it, you know, typically, um, you know, or it's possible to use pigments to achieve a color match. Um, and so that would show up um, if somebody looked very closely at the repair. So you can achieve something that can be differentiated um, from the substrate, but also looks the same. Another trick that can be done is the use of epoxy coated reinforcement or stainless steel reinforcement within a repair. Again, you don't see it, but if somebody were to look closer, they would be able to tell that that was a repair using current technologies as opposed to original. Um, uh, Diane wants to know how the sheet, the sulk, she calls it the sulk sheen uh, was achieved. How was that uh, done? Yeah, so um, it's all about the formwork. It really was achieving a formwork um, that we used a, a HDO, so it had a very smooth finish, not very absorptive of water at all, and so we were able to match the sheen. I don't know. I know originally um, when I talked to Paul Matt and I was really kind of questioning him about the formwork, apparently I think they did two or three layers of lacquer on the wood forms themselves, and so again, you know, using the technology available at the time, now we have HDO, um, but back then, you know, as part of that work to achieve that sheen, we were able to do it with lacquer. Um, Mary is asking, in your discovery, was there an attempt to use or knowledge of uh, where the original aggregates were quarried, or is that not important from a chemical perspective? And then she yeah. sort of clarified by saying, like, if you have a different chemistry and you repair aggregates to the original, does that matter? Or does she wants to know if that her question makes sense? Yeah, no. Um, so the original building at Tetzalk was constructed with lightweight aggregates. We did not use lightweight aggregates going back in with the repair. And part of that was um, kind of to address the porosity of the repair um, and make them durable and really to achieve what we needed to. But the we did look at the original sources of materials um, and you know, that, that did come into play. Unfortunately, you know, the, where the aggregates were sourced from is now a strip mall in Ventura. Um, and the quarry where the original cement had come from is still active. The, uh, that was the Riverside Cement Plant, which is now a Cal Portland plant, um, is still active. But something to remember in seeking out kind of the original materials and the original quarry with concrete is you're going to be within a different vein within that quarry. So even though you're using the same materials, they could have very different aesthetic and technical characteristics um, that could be a problem uh, in terms of matching. Um, now there's some questions about maybe the, the chemical actions in the concrete, everything from carbonations to chlorides. And uh, Diane wants to know what sort of factors determine carbonation and also what factors create chlorides? Yeah, so this, this again could be um, a whole day uh, just kind of talking about these material attributes, but the, the original mix design itself um, will come into play with the rate of carbonation. Um, so, you know, high water to cementitious ratio could probably be a very much more porous uh, material and so you could have a higher rate of carbonation. Again, use of lightweight aggregates can sometimes increase carbonation. Um, and chloride exposure, you know, we don't really see the use of uh, de-icing salts. Um, sorry, there's a fly um, right now in front of the camera. Um, we don't really see de-icing salts so much in California or in milder climates, but you know, in areas where they do get snow or freeze thaw is a consideration you know, de-icing salts are a major source of chlorides. Here on the coast, um, where we do see chlorides, you know, again, part of the, you know, accelerating of the corrosion chemical reaction that can happen with the reinforcement, you need, you know, those chlorides can accelerate that. We do see that from air-carried chlorides. So that's, you know, coming from the ocean 
Um, you know, all those fogs that kind of hang around in La Jolla, those will carry some chlorides with it. And so it comes down to exposure and proximity to the ocean here, here in California, typically. So um, a question about uh, concrete's most common color. Um, why, why is concrete always this grayish color and why don't you see more uh, reds or browns in concrete? Yeah, it really has to do with the cement itself, um, just how the cement clinker um, is made and the material constituents of the cement. And then, you know, as it's processed, you, you get that kind of more than the right family. But we really start looking at it, and, and if you are a concrete geek like me, you notice it's a well color. Some cements are much more in the buff family. And they have warm tones rather than cooler and more gray family. And so um, I have to say, it's always entertaining for me to be talking to a contractor or a concrete supplier and say, well, I just need the concrete to look more warm. I have no idea what we're talking about. But, um, you know, you can actually um, other people, actually, general annex to slide flash those kids. Um, and really understand kind of the zero characters that hey, will affect your, the color. Your, but, uh, your sound is fading in and out again for some reason. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I think, I think with all these oh, questions. Back. Yeah, it's back. Yeah. Yeah, I think all these questions in my sound, maybe, maybe we'll have to to get some more speakers and maybe do some more discussion on concrete as a material itself. Because these are really technical questions and I'd love to dive into them and they could be entire talks on their own for sure. Great, yeah, your sound sounds fine right now and we still have a few minutes so we'll, we'll keep trudging through if we can. Okay. But, um, and there was a question from somebody asking if you could do another program <laughs> on, um, on the, I guess the, what was it, the evaluation and the treatment of um, concrete, but um, so uh, maybe we'll be approaching you soon to do, to be a part of a panel again. Um, but then there was another question about um, the rust expansion at the salt. You sort of addressed it, I think, but um, Stephen is asking, given the damage being repaired at this salt, salt is due to rust expansion what steps are taken to discourage this and the repairs? I think you covered it a bit, but maybe you can reinforce that. Yeah, um, and that's something, you know, obviously there are various methods to mitigate uh, corrosion. Um, you know, sometimes you can apply a protection system to reduce the limit of water that is needed for the corrosion um, chemical reaction. There are other things. Um, can be done as well um, within there, and I, I'm getting notes that my sound isn't working. Um, but there, there are lots of things. But again, you know, we did not, we couldn't consider a protection system at the salt because that would change aesthetics, and that's really hard, especially with modernist structures, is kind to come up with mitigation methods. You know, the approach was this was going to be something that the salt institute would be dealing with um, given just the nature of their building. Um, they were very lucky in that it had lasted as long as it did and that just speaks to the craftsmanship of the building itself. Um, but you know other buildings there are other considerations that can be made as well. You know there's always um, galvanic anodes or corrosion um, other corrosion mitigation systems that can be considered based on the project. Um, yeah your sound is working now. I think if you switch mics, it seems to kick back yeah. in here for some reason. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I think I'm looking through some of these questions just to be sure we hadn't already covered them. Um, how, uh, question from William is how you offset possible shrinkage in your repair mix. Yeah, again, this is one of those technical considerations that has to be considered and use of current technologies and current materials, um, you know, trying to achieve that. There's always admixtures, but I think one of the most important things is really curing the material. 
um, and you can reduce the amount of shrinkage by extending the curing period and make sure that curing is really important. And so if you have a form prepared, you can just leave the formwork on um, and it'll hold it in a moist condition. If you don't, you need to make sure that you're doing or you have an exposed repair um, that methods are being used to cure that material. And that will definitely reduce any shrinkage potential. Okay, great. Um, and then Ken is asking, are there any additional considerations for repairing structures in the ocean, i.e. I piers and seawalls uh, like the children's pool in La Jolla? Yeah, there's, those are, <laughs> totally different beasts and animals um, to look at. And that's where, you know, something like a um, galvanic anode or an impressed current system may be warranted. Uh, those are really, really popular um, with marine structures as well as um, marine vessels. Um, and that's technology that's been around for a really long time. So that, that may be an option. Um, in looking at something that's in a marine environment, it's, you know, you had this heavy civil infrastructure um, within ports, you know, totally different ball game and there's different technologies that are used there compared to um, buildings and, and even bridges in some, some areas. Great. Well, I don't see any additional questions. What I'm going to do is type um, a link into the chat box, uh, which is a link to our evaluation page and um, wanted to encourage everybody to leave feedback about today's program and also to uh, think about joining the rest of the, the series. This is only part two of seven parts for the modernism series that we have here and I believe the next one is occurring on the 30th. Um, so check out our website to see more of the upcoming programs if you aren't already registered for the full series. If you are registered for the full series we'll email you the the link prior to the program. And uh, in the meantime, please do leave feedback and let us know what other programs you would like to see. And I wanted to thank Anne for her time today and for the wonderful presentation she gave. So, um, and maybe we'll be reaching out to you soon about another program in the future. Yeah. And maybe that by then we'll have better technology in these virtual <laughs> environments. So again, apologies for any sound issues, but thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you all for joining us. And I'm going to close the room for, uh, for the rest of the day and um, let us know by email if you have additional questions. I'll send those to Anne. Oh, one final thing, Anne, is I think people were asking if I could share your presentation with them, with the attendees, or are you? Um, I'll, I'll talk with you offline. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Thank you all and have a great day. Thanks.